everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm sorry because from positive energy, I'm going to talk about <laughs> negative energy, about crime, criminals. I'm so sorry, Madam Radhi. And everyone, hello everyone. Yeah, who committed this murder? Who is the potential suspect? What are the characteristics of these criminals? Why Ali killed his own daughter? Why Davy stabbed for 16 times? His husband, her husband. Why? 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 To all these questions, we criminologists, we have the answers. Yes. My PhD research was on psychological profiling of 100 Malaysian male murders, a groundbreaking study in this country. For that, I went to 13 prisons. And yes, prison is more like a second home for me and to all the criminologists. And what is criminology? It's a subfield of sociology which study on three aspects mainly. Study on three aspects. Of course, the first one is crime. Why this crime happened? What is the modus operandi of this crime? How they plan to commit a murder? All this. And second one, our focus is on criminals. And one of the, the main questions that I receive from my students as well as my friends is like, Doctor, do I have any criminal tendencies? Right? By just looking at my face. Right? I, I'll just say, no, I cannot say that. Right? I need to assess you. We have assessment tools so that we know whether you have this tendency or not. If I just say by looking at your face, I'm not a criminologist. Probably I'm a bomo, right? Yeah, all right. The third one is victims. Why A became victim in this crime, not B, and so on. So we focus on these three main elements. Crime, criminals, victims. So these are the core elements of criminologists. And we do collaborate with these stakeholders, our strategic partners, of course, the first one is Police di Raja Malaysia, our Royal Malaysia Police. Why we collaborate? Because we are act as a supporting hand to the police officers, especially crime investigators, to narrow down the pool of suspects. We do we do provide consultation to the police officers, right, on the possible or the potential characteristic, possible characteristics of a criminals, all that, and we do provide information on the how to solve a high-profile crime, for example. And of course, the second one is Malaysia Prison Department, Ibu Penjabatan Penjara Malaysia. Why? Why we need to work with prison department? Any idea? Because we want to get the access towards criminals, right? We want to study their psychological aspects. For example, we want to know what are the psychological characteristics that make someone to become a rapist? We cannot find those rapists, those rapists on a street, right? So we need to go and find, we need to get the assets. So for that, we will have a very good collaboration with our prison department. And at the same time, we come up, we formulate the intervention formula for the, or rehabilitation formula for the criminals. And the third one is NGO, non-governmental organization, such as Malaysia Crime Prevention Foundation. This is for proactive crime prevention purposes. Yeah? For example, we do a case study or we interview the criminals. We study how actually they target a house, for example. And then from there, we will derive the safety tips and we will channel to this NGO. And this NGO will channel to the public. Yeah, more on proactive crime preventions. Yeah. As like in medicine, for example, there are so many disciplines under medicine, for example, gynecology, orthopedics, public medicine, public health, 
family medicine and so on. Similarly, in criminology, we have various disciplines. For example, we have criminal psychology. Criminal psychology is one of the sub-disciplines within criminology where they tend to assess the criminal minds. They want to see what are the psychological factors that make someone to commit a crime. Yeah? We do have penology. Any idea what this penology is about? Penology is a very new area in Malaysia where this field focuses on punishment, the prison system, the penal system. For example, what type of rehabilitation that we should give to a hardcore criminal? What type of treatment program that we should give to a rapist, sexual offenders and so on? What are the best punishment that we can offer, the parole system? All these are fall under Penology and another one, criminal psychopathology. Yeah, these people, criminologists who specialize, sub specialize in criminal psychopathology, what they will do is they will deal with psychopaths, they will uh, collaborate with forensic psychiatrists and to study the mind of psychopathal psychopaths. Yeah, for example, we have, yeah, we have done a quite number of research. For example, there's a murder victim over here. Right. By looking at the injuries, can we guess or can we get some sort of preliminary uh, idea that this, the offender, is a mentally disordered person or not? Can we? By looking at what? Any idea? Right. One clue that we can look for is, of course, the type of injuries. Yeah, for example, here there's a murder victim and when I investigate and when I examine, I found out the injuries are directed on the face, only in the face. So that is a, a clue that possibly the offender is not normal offender. Right? He should have any type of mental disorder like delusional disorder. Why face, for example? Because this abnormal offender, they feel that the face are threatening. The face are look like a tiger, like a bear and so on. So therefore, they will target the face. So these are the uh, aspects that we can derive yeah, at early stage of investigation. That is the role of criminal psychopathologists. Yeah? And we do have victimology. Yeah? Victimologists, they are criminologists who deal with Victims, crime victims, what are the strategies, what are the uh, preventive mechanisms that can make someone from being victimized in any crime. So that is the role of victimologists. And in Malaysia, we do not have any victimologists at this moment. So it's your turn. Yeah? Right? So these are the... So I, okay, what we can answer? And of course, possible motives. Yeah? We do not need to interrogate yeah? by just looking at the crime scene or just looking at the murder scene, the murder victim, we can come up with what are the possible motives. For example, I interviewed 100 male murderers and for your information, out of 100 cases, almost 70% murder cases in Malaysia are expressive in nature, uh, based on expressive motives. The murder is committed because due to volatile emotion, anger, frustration, and so on. Only around 30% murder cases in Malaysia are based on instrumental murder or instrumental motive. What is instrumental motive? For example, they kill someone because they have a benefit over the victim. They have a reason why they kill the victim. For example, we can this type of uh, instrumental motive murder can be noted in a very high profile crime. For example, in the case of Sosilawati, for example. The case of Mona Fendi. Do you know who is Mona Fendi? Yeah. yeah. So those are instrumental uh, motive derived murder. right? So by just looking at the crime, just looking at the murder victim, we can identify what is the possible motive. So now, let me ask all of you. Let's say A is expressive murder, which is due to volatile emotion. B is instrumental murder because of any gain or any benefit. Okay. 
Now, let's say I go to a crime scene and I found a body with multiple stabs on the chest region, on the chest area. Now, let me ask all of you, it is instrumental A or expressive murder B? A or B? How many of you say A? How many of you say B? Yeah, the answer is B. Yeah, it's expressive. When there's a multiple, when there are multiple steps that indicate volatile emotion, that indicates the person transferring his his or her anger towards the victim in terms of step. Yeah, that is one of the clue. Second scenario, I go to a murder uh, scene, yeah, crime scene, and I found out there's a no body, no murder victims, right? Probably the murder victim uh, body is concealed by the murderer. So now, it is A, instrumental motive, or B, expressive motive? A or B? How many of you say the answer is B, expressive? The body was missing. B, expressive. How about A, instrumental? Yeah, I think all of you can become a criminologist. That's the correct answer, actually. Yeah? Why A? Yeah, why A? Because, alright, when there's no emotional component is involved, most probably the murder is planned murder. Yeah? It's pre-planned murder. So when there's an element of pre-plan, most probably they have decided how to conceal the body, the victim, yeah? uh, by uh, burial method or by post-mortem uh, arson and so on. Yeah? And most probably, we also can do deduce on criminal and suspect profile. For example, like here, I give a very simple analogy. You go to your friend's room in the hostel and you found out your rooms, your friend's room is very messy. It's very or disorganized. The clothes, the dirty clothes are everywhere. All right? There are so many unwashed plates. So, and your friend is not in the room. Your friend is not in his room. By me, can you guess what are the personality of your friend by just looking at that room? Yes or no? Yeah? Maybe he's a very messy person, he's not an organized person, meticulous, he's not, uh, he's not a very clean person, right? Similarly, the same application goes to crime scene profile. When, you, when we go and see, witness a crime scene, we can somehow deduce what are the characteristics of the criminals. Because we believe that during the profiling stage, we believe that whenever a person commits a crime, his personality is somehow transferred in terms of evidence, somehow transferred in terms of his behavior, his action, and so on. For example, we found a body, both hands, the victim, both hands are tied up, for example. What, what are the explanations that we can give on the characteristics of the criminals? Most probably, he is the person who looks for dominance. Yeah, all right. For example, there's a there's a there's a case called condom murder. Yeah, let's say the victim was dead. Yeah, was killed, and the condom, the used condom, was placed on the face or placed inside the mouth of a victim. So what we can deduce from that? He is the person. What what is the what is the action says about the person? He, the criminals, wants to humiliate, humiliate the victim. So these are the characteristics by studying, by analyzing the crime scene, we will get the possible characteristics of a suspect. And we will give this info to police officers. Yeah, look for the person with these characteristics. So that would be very helpful in terms of narrowing down the pool of suspect. Yeah. And the third one, the most important one, is the risk assessment what we are doing in Malaysia currently? Yeah, to be more uh, specific, forensic or psychocriminogenic risk assessment. This one we can be done among, of course, the forensic population among the criminals and also to the public. All right? Do you want to give a try? Yeah. I can tell you whether you have the tendency or not to become a criminal. Oh, yeah. Do you want to give a try? Yeah. yeah. All right. Please take your phone. 
and open the calculator app. Yeah, be quick. I have four minutes. Is it? Yeah. All right. There are eight items. There are eight questions. Right. And you need to rate those questions. Yeah. From one to four. Yeah. From one. Oh, sorry. One to five. One is strongly disagree. Five is strongly agree. For example, I love to eat apple and apple. If yes, please put five. If no, please put one. If you are somewhere unsure, please put three. Are you clear about this? Yeah. So we have eight items. The, the minimum score that you should get is eight. And the maximum that you should get is 40, right? Okay. Now, the items are in Malay, but I will translate in English. The first one, yeah? Saya sering melakukan sesuatu perkara mengikut kehendak hati. I always follow what my heart says. I always do the things according to my, as what my heart says. That is the first one. Yeah? Second one. Saya ingin pergi melancong tanpa sebarang perancangan. I don't, I go for vacation without any plans. I don't like to plan out for my vacation. Right? That is second one. Third one, kadang-kadang saya suka melakukan perkara-perkara yang sedikit menakutkan. Sometimes, I do some scary things. Yeah? Sometimes, I do some scary things. Number four, saya akan mencuba apa-apa sahaja sekurang-kurangnya sekali. That means, I will try at least once in my lifetime. I will try anything at least once in my lifetime. Yeah? Right? We move on. Saya kadang-kadang melakukan perkara-perkara yang gila hanya untuk berasa seronok. Sometimes I do crazy things to seek for pleasure. Yeah, to seek for pleasure. And next one, saya mudah terikut dengan perkara baru yang menyeronokkan tanpa memikirkan akibatnya. Means I go, I tend to do things that give me pleasure. Yeah, without thinking of the consequences. And seven, saya suka parti yang liar dan bebas. I like wild parties. Yeah? Be honest, yeah? Be honest. And the last one. Feel like, I feel like hitting someone. Saya rasa seperti hendak memukul seseorang. I feel like hitting someone. Alright, are you done? Alright, please total up your score. Alright. Okay, just raise your hand. 8 to 16. Anyone? 8 to 16. Alright. Who got more than 32? Be honest. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, around 5. Yeah? So, yes. Sorry. Right. So, 8 to 24, you are very safe. <laughs> but those who got 32.1 to 40, alright, you have this ingredient. This ingredient is known as impulsive sensation seeking trait. Yeah? Impulsive sensation seeking trait. And this trait is very, very prevalent among criminals in Malaysia. Rapists, murderers, terrorists, extremists. Alright? We found out. This is based on the empirical research evidence. Yeah? Empirical evidence. We found out this trait is one of the Predictor of criminal behavior. Now, let me tell you what are the characteristics of those who got 32.1 and above. You are a risk taker. Yes? You are a pleasure seeker. Yes? Yes. <laughs> right? And you always put your situation in a very risky uh, situation. You don't care about the safety. So, those who have and you get bought easily. Yes. If your if your boyfriend or girlfriend with this score, please break up immediately. <laughs> Mary, right? can't because do they will anything. get bored. Alright. Mary, right? can't do anything. <laughs> so they, they will go for something new because they they want they are risk taker. They want to experience something new in their life. Therefore, this trait is very much associated with criminal behavior. No matter they are extremist, murderer, and so on. Why this forensic risk assessment is very important? Why? Because by just looking at the face, you cannot judge someone whether he or she got criminal tendency or not. Am I right? For example, this guy. Is he charming? Yes or no? Yeah, trust me, he's a serial killer. 
Alright? Take my day. And how about him? Is he charming? You sure? Yeah, I think he is charming. Yeah? But for your information, he is a pedophile. Yeah. Because you cannot judge a person. You cannot say that, hey, you are a criminal by just looking at, the, at their, his or her physical appearance. Therefore, you need this type of assessment. Alright? This is only one test. We have a lot of tests. And if, let's say, those who raised your hand uh, for the score 32 and above, if you similarly you got higher scores for all type of tests, you need immediate attention. Yes. Alright? What we will do? This one we will do among normal population, among public, among school students. And you, if you exhibit a very high score, it's not our intention to label you, hey, you are going to become a future criminal. No, that's not. But we want to help you. We, want, we, want, we will give early intervention, counseling. For example, you are a very aggressive behavior person. So what we will do? We will give anger management. We will suggest you to go for anger management. Because you have, if you have all the ingredients, the psychological ingredients, so you just wait for that right moment. If there's any trigger, you might turn out as a criminal. You might turn out as a murderer. Yeah? So this is the one. And I just want to share one or two research findings. Yeah? Just a short one. For example, when I visited, when I interviewed different types of uh, criminal population, yeah? he is not a criminal, yeah? he is a criminologist. Yeah, so these are a few pictures. All right, for example, when we uh, one of the research indicates that the local burglars who break in into the houses, they say we don't afraid of CCTVs. Yeah, that was shocking, right? But they say they are worried about Allah. They say if there is any house equipped with CCTV, they don't mind. They will just wear a helmet or mask and just go and break in. But if that house is equipped with alarm, they are not afraid, they are very afraid to go in because one, because of the skills. They say most of the alarm are wireless nowadays. So they don't have that skills, the competency to deactivate alarm. So therefore, this, is this helpful for the public? Yes. If your house is only equipped with CCTV, if you are not safe, your house is not safe. You have to install alarm as well. And the last one, the chopstick case study. Yeah. So when I we interviewed one of the burglar, he said he don't use hammer to break the uh, padlock. He just use chopstick. Like what? Yes. So he said the only tools that he go he bring is chopstick, which is made from plastic and, and a lighter. So what he will do, right? He will burn the lighter. And then he will insert the chopstick inside the hole of the padlock. Wait for a while. And that thing will get hardened right and move into the shape. Alright? And then that act as a key. Oh, and please do not buy chopstick after this. <laughs> Alright, so uh, with this limited time, I only can share this much. Alright? So I hope, right, many of you will be interested. If you have any questions, you can email me. And thank you, Harry Ward for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much.